Dear brothers and sisters, grace and peace are yours this day, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. It has been an interesting week. I know that some of you have been caught up in the drama that surrounds the transfer of power from one president to the next. For some folks, I love dearly. This has been a wonderful occasion. They have looked forward to this moment in time for a long time and think it's the best thing since sliced American cheese. Others that I love equally dearly have deep and dark fears about what's next brooding in their minds. Somewhere in between, a lot of the rest of us stand wondering what all the fuss is about. Some of us go through a week like last week, losing a crown, and that's the biggest pain that we had. <laughs> that's a little personal, but anyway. Um, but there are a lot of weeks like that where we find ourselves bouncing between joy and confusion, between happiness and sorrow. And sometimes we wonder what on earth is going on in this world when we see people making such a fuss. But let me relay a quote I stumbled upon, and I don't honestly remember where I came across it. But I think it's helpful, and it goes this way, I think. While we deliberate, God reigns. When we decide wisely, God reigns. When we decide foolishly, God reigns. When we serve God in humble loyalty, God reigns. When we serve God self-assertively, God reigns. When we rebel and seek to withhold our service, God reigns. God is the Alpha and the Omega, which is, which is, was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Quite simply, God reigns. Speaking of which, this was a huge topic for Jesus. This was the center of his coming and a core of our gospel lesson today. So before we get to that, though, it's time for a good old-fashioned Lutheran pop quiz. I know how much you love these things. Um, but I'm going to ask you this question. I want you to ponder it for a moment in your hearts. What exactly does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a Christian? Now, I will grant you. This is a heavy question, and it is more than just a little bit on the loaded side, all right? So let me help you out a little bit here. So think about St. John's mission statement for a moment, all right? It starts out this way. To know and proclaim Jesus Christ and as disciples. Good for you. As disciples. This is the core of our lessons today about life as disciples. Being a disciple means you are a follower of Jesus Christ. That is what being a Christian is all about. Plain and simple. No two ways around it. It's about discipleship. It's about coming into fellowship with other Christians and gathering and following Jesus. Paul speaks to this in our first lesson from 1 Corinthians. And it isn't necessarily about who baptized you or who your favorite preacher is, as we talked about a little bit with the kids. It's about Jesus. And as we baptized Audrina today at a 1030 service, and I had to double check her name with her parents because I'm never sure if I'm pronouncing it right. But nonetheless, God knows who she is. God claims her and names him her very, his very child. Yes, she will have some help from sponsors and parents and even her two little brothers. But her job from now on is to grow as a disciple, to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So another question I have for you this morning is this. If being a disciple means following Jesus Christ, how many courses have you ever seen on followership? I probably get two dozen pieces of mail a week here at church on leadership courses for pastoring in the 21st century, and leadership for Christian pastors, and leadership for Christians, and leadership for this, and leadership for that. And don't get me wrong, we need good and strong leadership in the church for the sake of the world. We certainly do. There is no doubt in my mind about that. But here's the deal. It's not all about leaders. It is about the one whom we follow. We are called to follow Jesus Christ, the servant king who came for us. 
And I think our gospel lesson is the starkest revelation of that particular ministry. Now we've heard about, the last couple of weeks, we've heard about um, John the Baptist. And, and we've heard about the calling of the disciples a fair amount during this first part of the Epiphany season. And it's, it's one of those things where it keeps repeating. And I think there's a reason for this, because it's really important. They want to get this idea through our head about Jesus and why he's here. So last week we heard about John the Baptist and proclaiming. Before that we had the baptism of Jesus. And today we have John the Baptist once again. But this time John the Baptist is being thrown in jail. And Jesus seems to see this as a cue to begin his public ministry. And he begins it how? He begins it with a call to repent. To repent and return to God. The same call that John had made before him. Jesus goes out with this call to repent, and with this theme of bringing light into the darkness. And that is the job that he brings, to show the light and love of God to those who sit in deep darkness. So what's the first thing that he does with that kind of mission statement before him? He calls disciples. He announces that the kingdom of heaven is drawn near, and then he goes and he finds disciples, and he says, follow me. And you know what they do? They follow him. It's remarkable. Now, when I say they follow Jesus, I don't mean the modern equivalent of following Jesus, which is the, oh, Jesus, you'd like us to come hang out with you at church and grow in faith. Um, well, let me look at the calendar. Let's see here. Mm, three weeks from now on Tuesday from 7 to 8.15 looks really good. Would that work for you? Oh, no, 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 that won't work. The kids got soccer that night. Uh, no, no, let's see here. How about two Sundays from now? No, 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 no. Aunt Fiona's got a birthday party in the room. We have to go to that, too. Um, gee, follow you. It sounds nice. You seem like a really good guy and everything, but I don't think we can quite swing that right now. So, and you know, we're so stressed, so life is so busy, and you wouldn't want to put any undue stress on us, would you, Jesus? No. Today, when Jesus is taking a lovely walk by the shores of the Sea of Galilee, he sees two brothers, fishermen, busy at life. And he says to them, follow me. And they do, immediately. In the middle of life, in the middle of doing what fishermen do, which is fish, Jesus says, follow me. And they leave their nets and they follow him. And I will make you fish for people, he says. It's an amazing thing. Then he stumbles across two other brothers, two of my favorite pairs of sons in the Bible, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And they were there just doing another day's work. They'd been out on the boats fishing. They were there with their dad and in their nets, helping out with the family business. And Jesus says to them, follow me. And immediately, they left their boat and their father, and they followed Jesus. Kind of makes you what old Zeb was thinking in the boat. You know, he stays late in the air to do the next song on the <laughs> You know, it's not recorded in scripture, but I'm sure that was what was going through his mind anyway. While it's not recognized as Jesus' first miracle in the Gospels, I see this calling of the disciples as nothing less. Jesus calls them and they answer immediately and do what he asks. It's amazing. These first disciples followed Jesus, and in following Jesus, it changed them forever. And in changing them forever, it also changed the world. Here's the deal. This is what each one of us as Christians is called to do. We are baptized to be disciples, to be followers of Jesus. This is not a set it and forget it kind of a thing. It's a lifelong learning program. We are to follow Jesus not when we have the time, not when it's convenient, but always. We are called to put Him first and foremost in our lives. But man, this can be difficult. This past fall, I was blessed to attend a whole series of continuing education events kind of packed in the month, uh, end of September into October. And, and I learned so much that it's finally just now finding its way back out of my head. That's the way it works in here sometimes. Um, but we had a great a gal that came in who was one of our presenters, and she was a, a lead researcher for the Willow Creek Association. Now, Willow Creek, for those of you who don't know, is arguably one of the most influential churches in the world in the last 30 years. And as they approached the 30-year mark of their ministry, they decided to put together 
uh, a study of their ministry to see where they were going and what they were doing and if what they were doing was working. They called the study Reveal. And boy, did it reveal some stuff. While they had grown in numbers like mad, they weren't doing what they thought they set out to do in the first place. They were not making disciples. They were not growing disciples. Now, you have to admire them for their honesty and their transparency. They admitted their big books. They admitted where they had gone off track. And they were growing in numbers, but not disciples. And they were doing their best to correct that. Now, lest you get up on your Lutheran high horse and say, well, we don't have issues like that. Hold on. If you count the inactive members that we have in St. John, we have over 2,300 members. 2,300 souls who call St. John their church home. I'm a little proud of that. On the other hand, it infuriates me. Look around you. We're what? 120 this morning at this service? Not so bad, really. 2300. 120. Even if you add all our services together, we go between 300 and 350. Somebody once said to me, Pastor, why don't you go do something about that? I said, I don't even know who these people are. You do. They're your friends, they're your neighbors, they're their family members. If you want to have a conversation with them, start with you. When I first got to Washington Island, my last Paris, there was a dear old lady who came up to me and she said, Pastor, what are you going to do about those people who don't come to church? I said, I don't even know your name, much less where they live. Why don't you invite them to come to church? She goes, I couldn't do that. I said, then I can't. See, here's the deal. This is the work of a disciple. You go out, you follow Jesus, and one of the things that Jesus oftentimes allows you to do is to grow in ways that you feel uncomfortable growing. We have nearly 2,000 people every weekend that associate themselves with this congregation that I don't see. And that breaks my heart. Because discipleship is an active and growing relationship. That is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Now, many of you do your devotions, and that's great. Many of you read your Bible at home. Good for you. God bless you. But I have been your pastor here now for 12 years. And I can count, and this is a guess, but I think it's a pretty guess, pretty good guess, that less than 10% of that 2,300 I have seen in one form of adult education or another in this congregation over 12 years. Some of you are frequent you know, offenders. I've seen you here a lot. All right? And God bless you for that, because otherwise nobody would show up. But I don't know if you notice, but we haven't offered any adult education between services this year at all. And the reason why? No one showed up. It wasn't because of the different classes that were offered. I had frequently had said, oh, pastor, I'd love to come to that. But I simply can't. The Packers are gone. Or, pastor, I can't come to this. Why not? Well, I have to go to brunch then. You know, now fine. Eating breakfast is good. Following a football team is dandy. But if you're putting these things first always, and never putting Christ in the first place to follow, you are following the wrong thing. There's this great image that's going around Facebook at this point in time. It's from, uh, and it's not political, which is great. I love it. Um, it's a picture from the TV show Mama's Place, uh, where her son says, Now, Mama, you don't have to go to church to get to heaven. And the next frame shows Vicki Lawrence as Mama saying, Well, you don't have to have a parachute to jump out of a plane either, but it certainly helps. <laughs> You see, Jesus still calls his disciples to you and to me to follow him. And in following Jesus, you will be changed. And if you haven't changed much, maybe you're not following Jesus. I've had many people come up to me over the years and say, well, this is why I can't do that, Pastor. This is why I can't do that, Pastor. And I tell them, it's okay. You're busy. Jesus understands where you're at. And they look relieved. But unfortunately, I can't ever leave it there. But then I say, what's not okay is not doing anything about it. If you haven't been to church in 12 years, show up. We'll be glad to see you. And don't be embarrassed if somebody says, are you new here? Because you haven't been here for over a decade. <laughs> they start looking at me with panic in their eyes. And I say, it's okay, but you have to change that. You have the ability to do this. 
All right? You see, at the very core of Jesus' message is this repentance. To turn back towards God. To start again. And my friends, repentance isn't the word that beats us up. It is a word of hope. It is a word of good news. It's a word of a fresh start in Christ. It is never too late. Sometimes, though, we think we fall. And we'll just leave ourselves there. And, well, we'll never amount to anything. And Jesus can't love us the way we're at. Whatever happens to be their excuse. There's this great story when I was a young man in Wisconsin, the Jansen family was huge in speed skating. Speed skating was the thing when I was in my last years of high school and you know, the Jansen family were huge in that sort of thing. And I remember the 1988 Olympics watching Dan Jansen fall twice uh, during his skating time. And after that, he brought in Dr. Jim Lohr who helped him find a new balance between sport and life. He also helped Jansen learn to focus on the mental aspects of skating and brought in a new coach by the name of Peter Mueller to, become, uh, to work with him and worked out Dan harder than he'd ever been worked out before. And by the time the 1994 Olympics rolled around, Jansen was more confident than ever. He had set five, the 500 meter world record just two months earlier and the Olympic title in that event seemed to belong to him. Unfortunately, I remember watching this on our television set at, in, in, at, at home. When he fell during that 500 meter race in the Olympics, my heart sank. It was just devastating. But Dr. Ward immediately advised him to start preparing for the next race, which is the 1,000 meter race. He said, the 500 meter race is gone, it's done, it's over, there's nothing you can do about it. Put it behind you. But the 1,000 meter race is coming up next. Well, the 1,000-meter race was Jansen's worst event of all. He had never done well in the 1,000-meter race. But there was no other chance for him to receive a medal. So focusing on that race, he raced the race of his lifetime. And he won the 1,000-meter race and did it in record time. Since Jensen had followed the wisdom of his coach, he had put his failure behind him, and he tried something new. We can play it safe and remain secure in what we know. Like fishermen, our lives will remain in darkness until we are willing to follow and move in a new direction. Jesus called the disciples to something that would not only give them purpose and meaning in their lives, he called them into a way of life that would change the world. They followed, and from that time on, their lives would never be the same. And Jesus calls us as baptized children of God to follow just as he called those first disciples. We are called to become each day what we already are in our baptisms. When we grow as disciples and do what disciples do, we follow the lead of Jesus. And according to our mission statement, the acts of the disciple are to reach out in love. We do this when we do what Jesus did. When we feed the hungry. When we bring healing to those who are sick in mind, body, or spirit. When we bring light to those who sit in deep darkness. When we are with those who are lonely and those who have no friends. When we spend time with them, we reach out in love. Now don't get me wrong. Reaching out in love can be devastating. It can be expensive. It can be difficult. But reaching out in love also means that we are also to help other disciples grow so that they too might join us in this reaching out. So that they too might change their lives. And in turn, together we will change this world. We are invited into the life of, um, life of mission. We are not asking God to help us on our own individual missions. But we are asking God to help us in Jesus' mission in the world. For we are disciples who follow Him. This is not about us doing something for God. This is about letting God do something for, in, and through you for the sake of the world. We are Christians. We are followers of the one who came to serve and save the world so that all may come to know the love and grace of God. That, my friends, what a Christian is all about. And that is our calling every day, no matter who is present. Amen.